Mass effect is the phenomena that allows for the alteration of mass within its area of effect, and by reducing a ship to near zero, it can reach extreme speeds, allowing for interstellar travel. This process led humanity to developing a myriad of technologies based on it, from vehicles to weapons, but my personal favourite from the Mass Effect series is the ship of Commander Shepard themselves, the SSV Normandy SR-1. Its design, to me, is one of the best in science fiction, and I love the attention to detail that permeates not only the ship, but the Mass Effect universe as a whole. So I'm going to drop some lore on it while simultaneously gushing about it. For a start, the Normandy was designed to be a Deep Scout frigate stealth ship, plain and simple. But that brief came with a myriad of problems and a long research and development process. Helmed by the Human Systems Alliance, the Citadel Council nonetheless had a vested interest in the project and helped support it, primarily through the Turian hierarchy who worked alongside the Alliance in designing it from the frame up. The original design for the Normandy was much larger than the final frigate, and many cuts had to be made to the initial designs to make it more reserved and completable within a realistic time. These original schematics would not see fruition, until the illicit creation of the Normandy SR2 by Cerberus in 2385, but that is a different vessel for a different video. Its captain was to be one Eli Zander, however David Anderson was selected to replace him as captain before 2183, and its initial shakedown cruise to Eden Prime. The vessel's construction was rather controversial among some in the Systems Alliance brass for several reasons. Firstly, the myriad of experimental and specialised technologies that were being developed for the Normandy drove the cost up prohibitively, hence the multitude of design retractions. By the time it was completed, the billions it had cost could have funded a much more powerful and proven heavy cruiser. The second objection was how involved the Turians were. This was mostly based on the fact that only 26 years earlier the Turians had attacked a fledgling humanity in the First Contact War. So aside from there being a number of old wounds among the militaries of both sides, there were those who wished to keep human innovations strictly away from the eyes of a species that less than three decades ago had been considered an enemy. The tension increased when the Normandy was assigned to Commander Shepard, despite the blessings of Captain Anderson, because as a spectre, it effectively put the Normandy under the control of the Citadel Council, taking the prototype away from the Systems Alliance's 63rd Reconnaissance Fleet that it was originally supposed to be posted to. From the outset, we can see that the Normandy is relatively small for a frigate in its design, its internals however do not line up with the outside scale, suggesting that the in-game model of a docked Normandy is slightly too small, but even overlooking that, it is a compact vessel. The vessel has a single airlock to the port and fore of the ship for easy access, and each section of the vessel has emergency shields that drop to secure against a hull breach. Beyond the entry, which has some railings on the ceiling, is the bridge where the pilot and co-pilot sit, as well as several other stations that are not always manned. In the SR2, one of these was to house the AI interface, so presumably one of these is the ship's virtual intelligence control. Here, we have a network of screens and layouts that very much place the helm as the main point of focus, with all displays angled for the pilot to see. Just as well as the Normandy's drive core is large for its size, and it has an overabundance of manoeuvrability and speed. Behind this is the neck of the vessel, where the corridor houses an array of stations. The functions of each console is not mentioned, but I think these are effectively the readouts and management systems for the majority of ship functions, such as communications, sensors, and most likely the ship's defensive weapons and kinetic barriers. The vessel is armed with Guardian point defence lasers for shooting down incoming projectiles, Javelin missiles, and a single Mass Effect Accelerator cannon. Its sensor systems are also numerous and range from reading all levels of electromagnetic waves, using LADAR, and an array of deployable microsatellites for scanning. Following the raised walkway down the spine of the vessel, we come to the CIC, or Combat Information Centre. This is the information hub of the vessel where tactical decisions can be made on the fly, in and out of combat. This room's most striking feature is the galaxy map in the centre of the CIC stations. 
This holographic display is a frequently updated galactic layout to plot courses and examine locations. It's viewable from every CIC station, but operable only from the walkway that juts into its centre. The navigator and command officers are frequently found here. The station being so far back is something inherent in Turian design, and was incorporated based on their input. There are pros and cons for this placement over the traditional method of having the CIC and bridge be the same location, usually nearer the fore of the vessel. Firstly, the CIC is more shielded in this location from external attacks, and quicker to reach from other areas of the vessel. It is also a Turian practice to allow the captain to have a view over all of the crew, and its placement facilitates this. However, it does mean that orders to the pilot have to be relayed by internal or personal comms. The more I think about this, the more I actually agree with Rear Admiral Mikhailovich, but I think I'll examine that in a follow-up video if you want to see that. It should also be noted that none of the stations here have seating, as people are frequently going to be moving among the stations to share information, and this would just get in the way. Behind the CIC and grand display of the ship's name, we have a corridor that follows the curvature of the ship to the briefing and communications room. This chamber has numerous chairs for the senior staff to hold briefings, as well as three holographic terminals to display incoming transmissions or data. To both port and starboard of the CIC, we have descending stairs that move down to the crew deck. The initial point here, aside from some computer displays, is the main cargo lift. On the other side of it is the mess hall, where the crew can enjoy their meals. The relatively small nature of it reflects the compact nature of the ship, and small number of crew, around 51. There is then an open deck area which serves little function, although it does have a seating area, possibly for recreational use, and the officers' lockers. At the fore of this deck are the sleeping pods. These are single occupancy capsules that are either evacuation and stasis pods, or simple beds. It's a little unclear. There are also accessible multi-person escape pods accessible on this deck, somewhere. To the starboard of this deck is the sick bay, and being a compact vessel, it is rather well stocked with three beds, complete with standard robotic surgical equipment, medigel dispensers, and the medical officer's desk. Moving through medical, we can find the research lab, which has only one desk and a small sampling of scientific equipment. It is also currently being used as storage, as the Normandy has no dedicated science officers. Good job you can find a research specialist in the field then. On the port side is the captain's quarters, which is a rather opulent one in size when compared to the efficient utilisation of space elsewhere. Inside is a double bunk, personal computer and small lounge. This seems a rather egregious waste of space, and in the original blueprints, the cabins was just as large, but relegated to a small out-of-the-way area at the top of the vessel. <laughs> which means... When it was downsized, someone insisted on keeping the captain's cabin's size. Heading back into the lift, we can descend to the hangar deck. The majority of this deck is dedicated to a single open space, crossed by supports. Opposite the lift is the hangar door, which has variable levels of opening, creating a large aperture for vehicles to leave with motorised ramps ready to extend should they be needed. The Normandy came equipped with the standard M35 Mako fighting vehicle. This too deserves its own video, because it's a mad little lad and I love its craziness. Behind the Mako station is a maintenance desk with a link to communications, making it a good spot for the requisitions officer. On the opposite wall we have the crew lockers and armoury. Having it on the hangar deck is a solid choice, as it allows soldiers to gear up and be ready to drop in an unimpeded space right next to their method of departing. Towards the aft of this deck is the engine room, this houses the main tantalus drive core of the ship, fuelled by element zero, and it is the heart of the vessel. As mentioned before, the Normandy has a rather oversized core for even the fast alliance frigates, making the ship unbalanced in the hands of an inexperienced pilot and engineer. Naturally, this deck has all sorts of maintenance and observation displays. The highlight of the Normandy, however, is its prototype stealth systems, the internal emissions sink. Lined throughout the vessel deep beneath the hull are lithium heat sinks, into which all emissions of the Normandy can be channelled. Instead of radiating the energy into space, as most vessels do, 
the Normandy holds on to this build-up of heat, effectively reducing its outgoing emissions to zero. This makes it incredibly difficult to detect, however it can only keep up this state for around two to three hours, before the level of heat build-up begins to affect the crew. Once this time has exceeded, the danger of expiring due to the heat increases and remaining in stealth mode can cook the crew alive. So that is the Normandy SR-1. There also has to be more to the vessel than we see. For a start, there's not a single latrine to be seen and we have no crew bunks. The lore tells us that on a small vessel such as the Normandy, the crew would mostly hot bunk, where some remain off duty and catch some sleep, and then make the bed to hand over to the crewmen they're replacing. Even this, however, requires some cots or bunk beds somewhere which we don't see. These things are also referred to as sleeper pods, but they also function as stasis pods and there are only a handful so I have to assume there is crew quarters somewhere that we do not see. Additionally, where is the galley and the access ways to the actual escape pods? The original blueprints of the Normandy class that the SR2 was built to rectify much of this, but quite simply there still has to be more of the SR1 unless everyone shares the captain's bunk. A One detail I like about the Normandy, in fact a lot of technology in Mass Effect, is the consistent appearance that it has all been fabricated and assembled. So many components have serial numbers printed on them which makes it look as if the vessel was almost 3D printed, which considering the construction methods and presence of Omnigel in Mass Effect, it probably kind of was. There was mention of a second Normandy class frigate, the SSV Angelat, in a news report in Mass Effect 2, suggesting that the Systems Alliance did indeed continue production of this stealth ship despite the costs. Understandable considering its proven track record. Thanks for watching this breakdown on the internals of the Normandy. I'm going to do a few more Mass Effect videos on the universe's tech and locations and intersperse them with other content. So until the next video, thanks again, I've been Rick and this is my favourite ship on the Citadel, goodbye.